is not the same. Hey everybody, guess who it is? Mike and Angela here to talk about polymathy. Um, I have recently started reading Mike's dissertation and it is excellent. It is truly significant contribution to the field of polymathy studies. So now we're gonna talk about it. We're gonna share you know, some of Mike's insights and his work. Um, before we dive into the specifics, is there anything you'd like to say about this journey? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm very glad to, to be doing this uh, now, today, after so many years, as you know. And so hello everyone, <laughs> first, it's so good. And uh, we, we are so just happy I remember the beginning of uh, our Facebook page when you started and then I entered very soon. I think you started, we had already met before, right? Mm -hmm. And then it was just a, you know, a, a little small group of people that had this idea that polymathy is an interesting thing to, for our lives and, uh, you know, it, it kept growing. And this journey, at least for me, it has been academically 11 years. So <laughs> I was just seeing the first exchange of emails with the professor that I had in Brazil and then uh, Bob Ruth Bernstein who was the first uh, uh, like polymathy studies luminary. That... Yeah, for sure. Oh yeah. <laughs> and That's I, what you to yeah. You know? yeah. I would love to like give a shout out to Bob and Michelle Ruth Bernstein yeah. who have also our work. Yes. Um, and yeah, I mean, you've been at this for like half of your adult life, <laughs> I mean, you know, it's crazy. And we've known each other since 2018. Yes. Um, and yeah, we've come a long way. The field has really advanced in those six years that we've known each other. It's gaining and, you know. Oh yeah, yeah. That, that's, yeah. You, you said in the post, it's a thing now. And even in my master's uh, uh, thesis in 2015, I said in the beginning, in the abstract, because of the obscurity of the term, I have to do that. It was obscure, so I had to say it was obscure, so I have to do this. We don't have to say this anymore. It's not obscure anymore. Nobody says it anymore. Yeah. So it, it, it is a different thing, so it's cool. Yeah. yeah, and I really, I think of you, I call you like my academic brother, because we both, you know, we were both in academia, like trying to promote this concept that like being narrowly focused for some people may work, but not for everybody, and that human versatility matters. And so you've you've stayed in academia and you plan to stay in academia. Yeah. Mike will represent polymathy very well. Uh, I'm I'm confident that you will over the course of your career, you will really do amazing work. I have such confidence in you. I've sort of veered away from academia a bit, and I'm more on social media and in pop culture with it, trying to spread the word about polymathy out that way. But together, I think we make a good team in that front. And Bob is kind of like our dad or something who started the, the field, really. Um, sure. so, that, yeah. That's how you start a movement. So you have all sorts of contribution. You know, of course, the academic contribution is something different. So you have a, there is a different arena that you play, right? You publish in journals. And then you, but of course, it's far from enough. So then, what is it good? Uh, a publication in a journal that a few people are going to read, even if it's the best journal in the field, you know, just a few people may read it, it is no good. So we need a whole, you know, field in terms of culture, not only, you know, uh, a one thing. So it's a cultural movement, as yeah, I see. For sure. Well, I have started, I haven't finished mm -hmm. reading um, the first few chapters of Mike's dissertation, and it is truly excellent. So our plan for today is for him to share some of his insights and contributions, mostly through some visual summaries, uh, charts and graphics that explain what he's been working on. So I think with that said, if you want to dive in and get oh, started? Yeah. That's good. All That's right. Good. <laughs> well, let's start sharing here. All right. So I'll hand it over to you. I may interject with some questions here and there, but go ahead, Mike. Sure. <laughs> okay, so the work is broken into three parts. It's mm -hmm. a big work. 
they call some people call it a behemoth mm -hmm. of <laughs> dissertation. But that's okay. It, it, it is, uh, we have to establish some things in order to advance yeah. a field. And the first question is like, uh, we want to know what this thing is. So that's why the title is, what is this thing called polymathic, mm -hmm. right? So if we want to, to uh, make claims and talk about how polymath is important for creativity, human flourishing, mm -hmm. uh, organizational outcomes, leadership, etc. We have to understand what the thing is yeah. before you say what it does, right? Sure. So how you do that? Well, generally you do a literature review, you go to a scientific database like Web of Science, mm -hmm. and you do a search. But since the concept of, of polymathy wasn't or hadn't been kind of systematized in, in modern literature, I, I just got a few hits by doing that. If you do that with classic concepts, I don't mean like in the strategy, resource-based view, there is going to be, I don't know, 100,000 articles <laughs> talking about this, okay? So you can do a literature review from that. So it wasn't possible with polymathy. And uh, worse than that, there were articles about polymath, but they didn't talk about the phenomenon. So Just one at a time. Yeah. Mostly, so much. my interest is not about, oh, how special and amazing uh, specific polymathic figures, mm -hmm. generally of the distant past were, exactly. like Leonardo da Vinci and Ben Franklin. Yes, they were amazing. In the, but the, my goal it's, was not, oh, they did that and see that was amazing, etc. No, I want to understand the phenomenon of polymathy and bring it uh, like to, to everyday life, you know, to everyday people. So thinking not about polymathy as a label or a status, a condition that you achieve after, you know, everybody celebrates your work and then you die and oh, this guy was a polymath and generally a guy like 300 years ago, you know, mm -hmm. that, no, what is this thing? What is this process that some people are drawn to, some people are not? And the people that are drawn to uh, and develop this process in a certain way, what does it what does it enable them to do? So it's polymathy as a process, mm -hmm. not as a label. Yeah, and okay. this is such an important point um, because for me, I felt the same way when I looked in the literature on polymathy. I mostly found articles about individual people one at a time. And what good does that do for humans today if polymathy is only for the distant geniuses from history? I was more interested in understanding, like you, polymathy as a human phenomenon in general, which can apply to people still alive. So that way you can elicit polymathic talent and help create and support more Franklins and da Vinci's potentially if you understand it as a human phenomenon that applies to can apply to people generally and not just people from the past. No, yes, certainly. So the first chapter is uh, an effort to try to answer that. And then uh, we had to do, I, I say we because I had help, especially from uh, Dave Berg, he's also a member of the group, uh, an enthusiast of, uh, of uh, the concept as well. So we went and, and checked ourselves manually, works. So this first figure is, uh, they are work from 1960, uh, no, 56 to 2020. So I finished this in 2021. So you see that how the graph had a, a, a bump in 2020. So if I did 21 and 22, probably it would keep like that. So it started becoming a thing. And then the second figure is uh, me trying to do an inductive work. So looking at how different people saw and viewed polymathy, could I, I uh, uh, identify themes? So that was the, the, the idea. So I saw that some people focus on knowledge acquisition, which I call uh, passive polymathy. Mm -hmm. So it's about how much do you know? And I, I make a joke, it's like the hermit. 
polymath, you know, mm -hmm. the person that or encyclopedic knowledge, but it's like a hermit that gathers this knowledge and stays in the mountain <laughs> and doesn't necessarily, you know, act on this knowledge. There is a subcategory of that called omnigenerate polymathy. That's historical. So uh, in the Renaissance and Baroque periods, uh, 1700s, some people talked about the study of all chambres of knowledge. And uh, so the first treatise, I don't know if I'm pronouncing correctly, but the first uh, work in uh, modern <laughs> literature was in uh, 716 something. I don't remember the, the date by heart now, but in what's Germany now, so by uh, Wolver. And uh, he said the polymathy is about knowing uh, let's say crystallized knowledge in society that he called doctrine. Mm -hmm. We have, uh, we understand doctrine as something bad now, right? You're mm -hmm. indoctrinating people. <laughs> no, no, doctrine is just a repository of, uh, uh, how can I say, accepted knowledge, mm -hmm. right? So that's one part. But there, there was another part that he called scientia. Uh, that's the same root as science, but for him it had a different a meaning it meant you doing first-hand inquiry. So you trying to understand the word, the world by yourself. So it was a combination of understanding the crystallized social knowledge and your knowledge. Mm -hmm. So that's that was interesting. And I mean, in general, it's just about the doctrine. So it's about the chambers of knowledge, which at that time was the trivium and quadrivium, like mathematics. Uh, music and, and other things that later became the, the liberal arts tradition, but it was more or less well defined back then. <laughs> we messed, we didn't mess up, but we complicated things and for the good, in fact. And then there is a different strand of the literature, totally different, like different people uh, seeing polymath in a different way, in a creativity way, and that's a much more modern strand, like I, I put the words of uh, Robert Wood Burns and Michelle Wood Burns saying, uh, Ronald Beghetto, uh, James Kaufman, Rane Vichavich in this category because they are worried about the creative part of polymathy and what's creativity, bringing something that's novel and useful to the world. And well, their not. work was useful. They were yeah. doing the thing that they wanted, you know, they want to meta in that way. Yeah, I agree that in, in modern times, it's really important to understand polymathy is not just something that's like fascinating for individuals, but also that's like useful to creative and innovative solutions, which we need now more than ever. Yes. What, one other thing I want to say, there was a, a quote in your dissertation I really loved, and it was that there's a difference between learning much versus thinking much. Oh, yeah. There's so it's about the process and this is what I'm doing in the next chapter. So the first chapter is like, what is this thing? And then the second chapter is, let's develop the theory more. So how can we understand how we how, how can we understand what this entails? And uh, let's break down this thing into three. That that was my uh, 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 proposition. And let's understand the process. So that's about the next chapter. I will talk about that very quickly, but I think it's uh, I think it's also connected <laughs> to the other thing, uh, the third aspect, which is a different way of looking, uh, like a, a more personality uh, way of looking. Why? Because if you let me see if I can go here. Oh, this is also inductive, so different meanings. So some people call it polymath, like the knowledge and skills. Some people said it's mastering all that's known or mastering some subjects. And some people talked about the creativity part, uh, the synergistic part, which is also related to creativity, but also this other part, the, uh, the view of polymathy as a personality thing. And I believe in that. And in fact, I then uh, proposed 
to look not inductively, meaning like first I had those works, I don't know how many now, like 70 works and tried to, to, to draw things from them. Mm. This other part was, was looking at, so what are the things that a priori we know that are important categories? So are we talking about the products? So in that, in that discussion before, is polymathy about the knowledge, polymathy about being creative, it's too centered, still too centered uh, on the products. So mm -hmm. the thing, how do you know if a person is a polymath? So you look at their biographies or the things, the artifacts that the person produced, the products. It's like, I need a creative person in my company. So what do you do? Look at the por portfolio. So it's a product-based uh, mm -hmm. perspective. But there are two others, two other perspectives, the person and the process. Mm -hmm. In the personal perspective, which is the, the, the last category, matches the, the other last category, is about you know, the, the constellation of uh, patterns, of uh, thoughts, behaviors, dispositions, inclinations that may arise quite early. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, there are some people that believe that in order for a person to be a, or qualify as a polymath, uh, the person must die and we wait 50 years, 100 years, and then we assess uh, their products with a more distance lens, let's say. And then we can assess. All right, that's one way. But then <laughs> we cannot solve the problem of the living people, right? <laughs> can, we, can we talk about that for just a second? Mm -hmm. And by the way, I think this model of is polymathy the person, their processes, or their outputs. Like, that's a brilliant insight. But this has been a debate in the polymath place community just recently. Like, is there value in identifying living polymaths or living polymathic people? And what does that mean? Uh, and there's some debate. I mean, I would say probably most people in the group sort of felt like, well, yeah, it's okay to, you know, mm -hmm. pursue and label someone as you don't have to wait till they're dead and gone. Um, to do that, because I personally think that there's power in languaging it and labeling it and stepping into that identity, because then you can be really intentional about what you do with it. Oh, yeah, totally. Right. Well, having there is power in language, that I, I don't see how it could be otherwise, you know? Some people say, how is that different from Jack of all traders? Of course, it's not Jack, it's not all, it's not traders. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to go into that now because it's going to—it's a different track. But like, and it has a negative connotation. So it's totally different to think about polymathy and thinking about being a jack of all trades. Yeah, right? they're right? different. It's so, not the same. Yeah. So, uh, and this debate is in fact not new. So most debates, <laughs> when you study history, like I went back to Heraclitus that coined the term polymathy to that, and he was talking about Pythagoras, so it's 500 years before Christ. So when you go back and see the debates, they were, they were talking about the value of, uh, you know, you going and doing things yourself or trusting the repository of knowledge. And that's the same discussion we're having today mm -hmm. on the internet. Can you trust institutions? Can you trust the, the research that somebody did? which has been discussed for 2,500 years. Mm -hmm. It's not new. So this discussion has been uh, uh, there in the creativity field, which had the same problem. So when do I identify when the person is creative? So some people believe in the big C creativity, which is the most eminent kind of creativity. The, the Leonardo one, da Vinci. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But is that the only kind of creativity? No, there is the little C the everyday creativity in Ronald the Ghetto and James Kaufman proposed one in the middle, the pro C. So when you write an article, you never know. It may, it may be a small advancement in the field, or sometimes later people may recognize the article as something that was you know, groundbreaking. But regardless, producing an article and publishing that in a journal, that's a, a, a decent type of creativity, right? Let's call it pro C. It may not achieve the big C status, but that's something, you know, that requires a lot of work, that's intensive, that requires recognition from society. 
So we we've had this discussion. Though, that there are like we don't need to 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 only a narrow definition, you know, of mm -hmm. uh, either creativity or polymathic. Even though I have my own preference, of course, and I can say it beforehand, it's polymathic as a process. That's mm -hmm. my own preference. Some people can understand polymathy as a label for the super creative people. And it has been like that for some people, but this was not like that in the beginning of the, uh, the history of the word, you know? So I mm -hmm. think the way I'm doing tries to bring together, you know, the historical meaning, the meaning that it acquired in Renaissance and the meanings, because it's plural now, that has acquired uh, uh, in modern research. I think that's the yeah. most comprehensive. And I just say, I mean, I've, I've told you this for years. I mean, I, I had to look at the academic literature on polymathy to write my own doctoral dissertation. And whenever I hear you speak about the literature, like you you label like Hoffman and Megiddo, and mm -hmm. you, you know, you just, you say all the names and you know the years mm -hmm. and you know the article. It's like ingrained in your mind, the literature. And I, as far as I'm concerned, you know the, the academic literature related to polymath better than any other human that I'm aware of. <laughs> and you. so the fact that you've distilled it and synthesized it and put it in writing in your doctoral dissertation, and it's written so clearly and organized so well and so logical is like a major contribution <laughs> to the field. Thank you. Really. Thank you. And that's it. So we have to sort it out to advance, or we're going to be eternally discussing Oh, is it like this? Is it like that? And then we cannot admit. Holy mouth, it can be lots of things. It makes sense. If there was ever a concept that could you could slice and dice and understand in different ways, it makes sense that holy mouth would be one of those. But what's the next step? So then I would have to take stake at one of those views, right? Mm -hmm. In order to advance, I would have to say, this is the view I'm using, at mm -hmm. least most of the time. <laughs> Not all of the time, sometimes I use other views. And then I even have the definition we, we, we can oh, sure. show Let's there again. Screen again. We're going to go in and out of sharing yeah. the screen um, just so we have better angles for discussion. But, yeah. yeah. So this is, uh, yes, I was talking about the different views. And when you match like person, product, does it require creativity? Does it not? So if it doesn't require its passive polymathy in the mm -hmm. elite status, that was the discussion that mm -hmm. we have. So the person has to die and then somebody else has to appraise their work and it has to meet a legendary status. That's the new view. All right, so I have to start this. And this is the definition. Oh, sorry. I have to talk about the tripartite thing, but let's look about the let's look at the definition only. So uh that's the how I proposed to define polymathy as a lifelong and life-wide approach to knowledge pursuit its development and application distinguished by the concomitance of breadth, depth, and integration. So it's a lot, so we have to distill <laughs> in parts. So the first two things, it's lifelong and life-wide. So it's very important to understand that there is no other way to think about polymathy than a lifelong pursuit. So it's something that people develop, right? Mm -hmm. So it's difficult to take a snapshot, you know? Sometimes the person, if you take a snapshot of a polymath's week, okay, the person may look like a specialist that week, mm, right. right? Or a dilettante the next week, mm -hmm. you know? So you have to understand, and that's very important in, uh, in education, mm -hmm. especially now that we expect to live longer, yep. if uh, we don't, uh, sorry to use this word, screw up, <laughs> we are expected to live longer uh, as human, mm -hmm. right? So it's important. My generation was like, you have to decide what you're going to be at 17. <laughs> and in Brazil, you have to change, you have to choose your major beforehand. So you enter the university as a uh, business major, engineering major, whatever, psychology major beforehand, and your uh, courses, they are kind of fixed. So it's like you decide your fate. You decide your fate yeah. without a sampling period. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's terrible. And uh, the lifelong thing reduces the anxiety. 
you can be many things. Yeah. Sometimes you can be uh, 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 many things uh, simultaneously, and sometimes it can be serious, uh, serially, mm -hmm. you know? So, so lifelong is very important. And the second term, which kind of a, a game of words with lifelong, because lifelong, if you just think about the chronological aspect, like you're moving, you know, uh, in the future through time. But the life wide gives an idea that even though, you know, I'm thinking about that it could be serially, I, I have an idea that in the future, I might do something different, mm -hmm. you know? It might be fuzzy, like it was for me. I know that I wanted to have a sampling experience. Mm -hmm. So I delayed my professional decision, you know, uh, then I decided to go into business just because of comparative advantages. It was so unclear. But I, what, what was clear? I knew that I wanted my life strategy needed breadth, yeah. but should not be without depth. Right. And hopefully in the future, it would generate some integrations. Yeah. So I went to the last part of the definition, but life-wide means that you don't think about polymathy just like learning many things at school mm -hmm. or doing many things in your profession. And by the way, the most common definition nowadays on the internet is polymathy as knowledge in multiple domains. It doesn't look like wide. It looks like a nerd studying different yeah. subjects, which can be part of polymathy, and often it is, but it's not like wide. So it doesn't talk about experiences. So in my case, I, I, the way that I solved that by being, you know, a young person in Brazil with not many resources, especially compared to, to uh, advanced countries where people have money to travel. I didn't, so I became a flight attendant. <laughs> that was one way for me to experience the world mm -hmm. before I could act, you know? Yeah. <laughs> of course, we, we are always acting, but I mean acting with more impact in the world, right? Yeah. So life-wide is a very important word. <laughs> Can I just make a comment? I love this concept of life-wide learning because for me, part of why my journey has included a polymathic approach is because I want to have a good life. I want to have the full human experience. I want to reach my potential and not in a narrow, contained way. I want to live life as well as I can. And so that involves, you know, exploration, Mm -hmm. and getting to know lots of different kinds of topics and experiences and hobbies and travel. And polymathy is a route to having, you know, the full human experience. So, and LifeWide gets at that concept yeah, yeah. pretty quickly. I, I think it's a precious word in the definition. And again, so why is it important to go back to the root, the historical roots of the concept? Polymathy arose not, not much after the word philosopher which mm. is attributed to Pythagoras. So they were thinking about how to live a good life. And then, so if we, if we go historically, we had Pythagoras, that was the first person that kind of invented academia in his own very unique way, quirky, idiosyncratic <laughs> way, but it was an advance. And he was trying to make a differentiation between the sages, the people that carry the traditions, mm -hmm. knowledge through tradition. So to differentiate, differentiate those people from uh, those people uh, versus the philosophers, the people who would try to get knowledge yeah. by themselves. So learning versus thinking, there is a difference. Yes, yes, different ways of learning, right? Not like. Second-hand learning without inspection, I would say. Yeah. And that was the the funny thing is that he gave this idea to contrast poly philosophy with uh, the sages, and then Heraclitus came and said, "You know, you are a how can I say you you are a fake or something like mm -hmm. that." Because you got all your knowledge from second sources, your theorem is not yours. Correct. By the way, he got it from the Egyptians. That got it from the uh, from uh, 
Sumeria, so the, where Iraq is uh, nowadays. So of course, it wasn't him, his, and he positioned himself like a sage, in fact. Mm -hmm. So the funny thing is that Heraclitus used Pythagoras against himself, and that, that's when the, the word polymathy was coined. In fact, as a criticism to Pythagoras. Anyways, and then we had, that was before Plato. Plato. Then we had Plato, and then we had Aristotle that is, became famous with the idea of eudaimonic well-being. So how do you live an authentic, you know, meaningful life? Yeah. All those things arose at the same time. For some reason, the philosophy stuck, became a field. Eudaimonic well-being is still a topic, a very important topic, like authentic happiness, uh, especially in positive psychology. And polymathy became obscure. So part of my work is trying to, you know, in my view, I think we made the wrong decision. <laughs> You're not highlighting polymathy more because I think it can give a guidance in a more specific way. Mm -hmm. And what's specific about polymathy? The breadth, the con concomitance, the, the, the uh, conjunction of those three pillars, which I call the tripartite approach. Mm -hmm. So we have to have the three. Yeah, so, it makes sense. It, it really does. It, it's unnegotiable. So you have to find ways to have the three. And then people talk about the paradox or the, the trade-off between breadth and depth. Like some people may have heard of Angela Duckworth and the grit, grit concept. Mm -hmm. She kind of, I think the problem with her concept is that it makes, you know, like it's mm -hmm. a, a bad, sorry to say, uh, uh, instrument for polymathic people because it makes us, you know, being stubborn with depth. Mm -hmm. the same thing, mm -hmm. you know? Anyways, so uh, uh, when you make the decision that you want both breadth and depth in your life, then it creates an urge for you to find a way to integrate. Yeah. And there is many, there are many ways. And the science of polymath, that's the field uh, I'm trying to, to make popular, you know? So the, the, the science of polymathy can help those people that have made those, that decision conscious or unconsciously, you know, not to let go of either how to make it work. Mm. The, the answer is there, integration. Yeah. <laughs> but there are specific ways, there are a multitude of ways of making it. And besides that, the other part of definition in the middle uh, is also important because polymathy is a process that has the knowledge pursuit, the development, and application. What does it mean? It means that polymathy is there before the application, before you see, you know, the, the, the works, the artifacts. It is there. It is there in the pursuit first, mm -hmm. the development, and then the application. But the application may be in maybe later, 20 years after that. In fact, that goes to, let me jump a little bit to this crazy figure here <laughs> <laughs> that I talk about how, how do you go about developing your polymathy and how does it change in different stages? So I made, I made this diagram with three types of effort you have to do. So in order to develop your polymathy, even though I said that you don't need to be Leonardo da Vinci or Ben Franklin, doesn't mean you don't need to make any effort, you know? Right, <laughs> sure. It's full of effort. Full of effort, <laughs> yeah. And then you have which effort? So one effort I call afferent, and afferent from biology are, is the part of nervo, the nervous system that uh, captures information from the world. And afferent is the part of nervous systems, uh, of your nervous system that uh, generates behavior. So this part is from the world to you. The other part's from you to the world. Okay. But I needed something in the middle, which I call introspective effort. How to make sense of this mess. If you're really polymathic and you never pass through a stage in your life that everything is a mess, something is wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so how, where do where does the mass come from? From the afferent effort, 
from the efforts for you to understand stuff, understand the world. And in the diagram, I put four different colors with arrows. Those are the things that you're trying to uh, bring to you, to integrate into your knowledge stock, let's say, okay? It could be domains, let's say, the blue would be more related to mathematics, the red would be perhaps more related to humanities, in the green arts, in the, the purple, some other personal experience, you know, I don't know how uh, uh, your, I don't know, could be any other domain, <laughs> I'm not creative right now. So you are gathering this information from the world. And then in the middle, how do you make sense of those things, you know? How, how can you integrate that? How can you make those things productive? It's very difficult. In the beginning, it may not happen. And that, that's also why there are only small arrow, arrows coming out of the circle. It means that you are still not prepared to act in the world with very, uh, with a big impact, mm -hmm. okay? So it, it, to the right, you have figure two, figure B, sorry. It's another stage, all right? Oh, in the effort efforts, if you, if you notice that our arrows going to the other direction, so we are not able to capture 100% of the information, right? This is a fact, mm -hmm. right? Uh, however, as you get more accustomed with how the information is structured, you get more efficient too. So if I need to read about anything in psychology, I already know where to go to and how to decode it. Mm -hmm. So a lot of this information gets effectively uh, internalized, even though it may also be a trap, because mm -hmm. how do you do that? You kind of use shortcuts sometimes, and you may disregard some information. But anyways, Let's assume that in general you become more efficient. And then sometimes the 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 how can I say the precedence, the salience of the fields change to sometimes the salience of what I'm doing is in one field, sometimes it's in another field. So it changes. Mm -hmm. But I think that through time uh, you get better, you know, at internalizing information and things start to make more sense, okay? Mm. And then you can use more information in order to do the last step, the effort efforts. So now you have come to realize, you, you have kind of, you started with a thirst of how the world works. And then you, and then you realize it is a mess. <laughs> <laughs> then you realize, oh my God, I can't solve this mess. And then, no, you can't. And then after some time, you realize, all right, so there are some things that I'm making sense. There are some special kinds of information that I have that other people might not have. Mm -hmm. And I, I may act upon those information that, that information and do something. Well, generally, the most effective effort efforts, they arise through that, you know? through an understanding and seeing gaps, and how do you see gaps in a polymathic way? Generally, either because you have seen something different from another field or your personal experience. Mm -hmm. That's like two important ways that polymathic people can see things not really, you know, the, 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 the math's not mathing, <laughs> something's wrong, so I have an intuition here. And sometimes that's the source of major contributions. Mm -hmm. This is so this is the advancement of, of the model. And do, do you want to ask oh, some questions? Sure. Here? So it's uh, so let me make sure I'm hearing this correctly, because this is the first time we've ever talked about this. Oh, yeah. Um, so it's almost like you know, in an earlier stage of life, you're more concerned with, with learning and absorption and making sense. And then eventually you get enough skill, you've exercised your brain muscle enough where you make sense more easily or you can contribute in new ways. You can create new knowledge rather than only absorb existing information. Mm -hmm. You can really think. Yeah. Polymathy positions you yes. to really think in a, in a, in a nice way. Yeah. Well, that's, 
where's the three? So that's why it's the tripartite approach. The three pillars, breath, depth, and integration come to place. Mm -hmm. Because in order for you to realize that a gap is really a gap, you need depth. If not, let's go back to yeah, those I words. Yeah, I want to talk about depth a little. Yeah, so let, let's go back to those words. So number one, if you don't have, if you only have depth, you're a specialist, right? Mm -hmm. you, you lack, it's number one, you lack the, the breadth. On the other hand, the opposite side, right? If you have breadth and you don't have depth, you are a dilettante. You go to many places, but you never acquire your substance to, 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 mm -hmm. from those uh, 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 explorations. Then the integration part. So when you integrate without knowing the thing, without having depth, it's what we call, uh, I call a puffiness. So that's a word that uh, Klaus Conrad uh, coined in uh, psychoanalysis for the like the, the kind of the combinations that didn't make sense. So they were trying to make things together, but in a nonsensical way, uh, seeing patterns where there aren't, you know. So they those would be false integrations. And then they have some kind of combinations. You have two, but you don't have another one. So uh, I named when you have the depth and integration, a field expert. So you are well integrated in the field and you have depth, but you don't have the breadth to be a polymath. Mm -hmm. The same thing when you have only breadth and depth, you are encyclopedist, but you don't integrate. So it's a passive kind of polymathy. When you have breadth and integration, you could be kind of a boundary spanner. So you could bring people together, but you don't really understand what they are doing. Mm -hmm. It takes an intuition, it takes breadth, but the, you don't internalize the depth. Okay. Uh, and seventh, the full range polymath, the person that has all the three very well developed. And number eight is, would be the full antithesis antithesis <laughs> of polymathy, which is called oligomathy. It's just oligo is few, it's little. So little <laughs> mathema, little learning. So that that's uh, a way to see. And hopefully it, it is connected to this figure, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm trying to do. Identify, connect, and theorize. I have a question. Sometimes people ask me, mm -hmm. and it's really hard for me to answer. People will go, so what percent, how many polymaths are there? How, what percentage of polymaths are there? And I know my answer, but I'm curious what your answer is. Then I have to go to my model. Okay, here we go. <laughs> so then in the model, I named three stages of polymathy. Yeah. So polymathic orientation, polymathic knowledge, stage two, and manifest polymathy. That's, let's say, let's translate that to polymathy at the pro C level. Of creativity, mm -hmm. so somebody that uh, does an analogous thing of writing a paper in a in a journal, whatever the analogous is in your field, mm -hmm. you know. Okay, so first we have to decide <laughs> which kind of polymath yeah. you do we want, and of course, within manifest polymathy, you can range from a person that publishes you know, some things and a person who is a god in the field, right? Okay, so we say polymath is a person who was recognized as making contributions at the big C level to several domains. So it's not only knowing many things, it's about products in different domains. That's one definition. Mm -hmm. Of course, that would be very few. So we just get the genesis and say, yeah. who was polymathic? And then you, you get, okay. Yeah, so, by that definition, it's yeah. It's very few. So, yeah, get it. He is a genius, yes. Is he polymathic? Yes. One count. <laughs> I don't know. Mozart, genius, yes. Polymathic, uh, no. No count. <laughs> In this case, that yeah. would be like that. Well, order to contribute to fields in an original way. Yeah. In multiple different fields. Even though I'm all order. Yeah, but even though I'm a, I do research mostly at the individual level. I'm not a big believer in the in the hero, you know, uh, discourse. Yeah. Of course, they were exceptional people. It's the circumstance. Yeah. I'm going to say around them. I'm going to say something controversial here. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So Leonardo da Vinci, right? 
two controversial two controversial statements. First of one, first of all, he was a specialist. <laughs> Second of all, I, he was the best. I don't know if he was even the best, but I would, <laughs> I would reckon that there were at his time perhaps 25 people <laughs> doing what he was doing, right? So how many people had the opportunity to be an artist at that time? First of all, you needed to be in Italy, basically, perhaps. Yeah, that was the epicenter. Where in Italy? Florence, Milan, Venice, I don't know, perhaps another. I'm not a specialist in the, in the, in the history, but uh, from what I know, right? You had to be in one of those cities mm -hmm. and you had to enter a studio. Okay, so uh, Leonardo was adopted. So his uh, foster father was kind of an accountant and he put Leonardo in an abacus school. You know, abacus, they think that, you know, people used to, to, to do math. So he, he was trained like, it's a difficult comparison to do, but I, I would I'll, I'll do it anyways, like as an accountant, right? That, that was his first training. But at 14, because of his connections, he went to a good studio, not, not a good, one of the best in uh, Florence, if I'm not wrong, with, with Verrocchio, right? When he arrived there, uh, let's remember that at the time, those people were commenced by rich, you know, uh, patrons, yes. and, and they would do almost everything, like painting, uh, goldsmithing, you know, work, uh, sculpture, and other works of arts, of art, right? So Leonardo would do everything. Mm -hmm. then. But then he, he came across this technique, sfumato, I don't know where from, right? Which is the technique he used, he, he became famous for. And he perfect this technique. And he was, the rock you put him, oh, so now you're gonna do painting. <laughs> so he became specialized as a painter. <laughs> he didn't do so much goldsmith. I, I haven't heard, have you heard of him? No. Or, or sculpture, even though his major work, yeah, he did. He, yeah, his major, uh, Opus, opus mm -hmm. would be a horse that didn't work because of a war. Anyways, but yeah, I, I just don't want to say he was only a parent, but he was kind of, you know, I don't like to use this specialist, of course, for him, but you, you have to understand how things work, you mm -hmm. know, in order to get this kind of contributions. But in any case, only a few people there. How, how if he didn't go to that studio, if he wasn't in Italy, you know, from to Italy, it wasn't even Italy at that time. Yeah, and he had access to, you know, resources. People paid him, right? And so he he could follow his curiosities and like he had a life of I wouldn't call it leisure because I know he he worked a lot, but he didn't have a normal grind like the rest of us. So I think that's part of why Leonardo could contribute is because he had people who recognized his intelligence mm -hmm. and wanted to support it and gave him resources. That's part of why I like to bring attention to Paul because there is power in mm -hmm. recognizing people who have you know, the ability to help the rest of us using their intelligence. Yeah, well, what I would like to dispel is the myth that the polymaths go against and fight against all the world and win. You don't. You're a part of, the, of course, in, in like you have to pick your fights too. If you fight against everything that you you would like to be different, you won't have energy. Yeah. So, management of energy is a key aspect. A lot yeah. of people, and I've been talking to people in the polymathy uh, uh, field in industry, and they say, oh, why don't you talk more about time management? Time management is less important than motivational and energetic energy. Uh, 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 management. Because sometimes you, I feel that I have time, so I'm terribly busy, but if you have time, but sometimes my eyes are, <laughs> are so tired, I cannot read anymore, I cannot think in a way, in a productive way, that's why, but if you have time, I don't have either the motivation of my, or, the, or, or, or the, the capacity to, to expand effort. Yeah. I, I don't have the energy. It okay. resonates with me for sure. So answering your question, we can take a look at polymathy like this, do this counting. We can take a, 
So, or we can look at polymathy to the left side with the latent part. So, polymathic knowledge is still latent. It's your stock of knowledge. Mm -hmm. It's not the knowledge that you, oh, see how much knowledge I have. Uh, something internal, right? Mm -hmm. Some of them are going to be useful. Some of them are not going to be. You have to choose. So, like, people don't have 24 hours to, <laughs> or are they interested to listen to this for, <laughs> for hours? Don't have to pick. So, those are some things that I think would be a contribution uh, for your thinking about polymathy, for the way that you you may advance yourself. So I want to be more polymathic or I want to be more successful as a polymathic person. So I'm trying to, to so those are the things that, are, that may help or I want to understand how polymathic fits into the world. But for me, this counting thing, I would solve at stage one with the polymathic orientation scale. Mm -hmm. So it's the first manifestation of polymathy that I can think of so it's antecedent by other things and I put there as temperament traits. Mm -hmm. So how does individual differences work? So I see that as a, a, a as fitting into the uh, problem of individual differences. So how people differ from each other. So in uh, being polymathic, like drawn to polymath, polymath or not drawn to polymath is one type of individual differences. But in this field of study, those that arise very early, that are biologically based, are called temperament. Like the babies, you see two babies, they could be siblings. One you know, likes to move more, to interact more, the other is quieter. So we have these differences very early. Very early. Okay, yeah. in childhood, so if you have kids, you know that. <laughs> Where did this kid get this from? <laughs> they they show behavior very early. Yeah. And sometimes it's surprising. It's like, where, where does, you know this behavior come from? Yeah. And it is it is like that. And it has a biologically uh, it's biologically based. Doesn't mean that's uh, hered totally hereditary or totally fixed. It's just a strong disposition. You know. Yeah. And it's biologically based because we already know we we. we that are correspondence to dopamine systems, acetylcholine systems, uh, uh, noradrenaline systems. We know they are involved in this kind of how people appraise uh, and behave in the world. Okay, so this is the uh, step one. Let's go. And the other step is personality. So then you develop, you start. Uh, um, interacting with people with society and then some other traits become manifest like is this child agreeable conscientious mm. right it's an attribution that we do socially right so that's the second step in polymathic orientation i think it kicks in when you are old enough to understand your relationship to the world mm. And that's about from 12 to 50. Mm -hmm. Then you like, you know, this path is, and sometimes it starts negatively, meaning it's something that you, it's not an approach, you're approaching polymathy. It's, in fact, you're running from sometimes specialism. So you see somebody, I don't want to live like that. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. <laughs> that was my, my approach, my, like, well, Me too. it happened to me not, not, it, via positive it was via negative I away didn't, from. Yeah. it's like away from versus towards yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. So i didn't want to have an narrow specialized life yeah and ah, i knew it at 12. i perhaps i could not articulate that very well but i knew that i knew that my life project would be polymathic even before it was yeah Same so here. From that age. And I think I have uh, enough evidence by now to kind of claim it's it's real, and then we can measure. So it's a spectrum. We can measure in several ways. All the measures are going to be imperfect, of course, but I'm in a field where we take measurements, right? To still do positive, positivistic science. Mm -hmm. So the chapter three of my dissertation is the development of this measure. So we, we ask questions for the person to try to, to gauge, does this person, you know, uh, believes 
he polymathy values polymathy as a life path. That's why it's called the polymathic path. It's not the only one, that's one path, but for these kind of people, my claim is that there are people that this is the only path. Mm -hmm. There is a way, so then you have to understand, we assume from this, how can we, how can you be successful as a polymath? And nobody asked this question to mm -hmm. any of us in this generation, and that's something that has to be corrected. Yeah, the assumption is that everyone will specialize, even yeah. though there's so many people that that's very uncomfortable for. Yeah. So I can't wait to check out this, this assessment yeah. more. And I think it has such applications, especially for you know people junior high, high school age to begin to figure out, do I wanna pick a narrow path when I'm 18 or earlier and stick mm -hmm. to it? Or do I wanna you know, view my life as having stages and more of an exploration of a variety of topic areas and experiences? So. That's the way I prefer to be. And yes. I, yeah, um, and I think a lot of people do. Well, if you don't have the words, how of the conversation? Exactly. Like the, people always say, oh, the, the, the what's the name? The in, Inuit mm -hmm. have uh, 50 names for snow, right? Right. It's the same way. If you don't have a name, it's very difficult to work with that. Exactly. And, and it's life has so much going on. You imagine teachers have so much going on in their life. So if you don't have, this is an important thing, okay? The name of the thing is falling messy. And some people like that, and then help those people. <laughs> it has to be like that. If that's not gonna work, so normal assumptions are gonna take over. So I think one of the ways that we can contribute to the world is that this assumption is wrong. And I know it. I know it for, from personal experience, yeah. and I know it from you know knowledge that I acquired systematically. And this is how we can correct this assumption. Mm -hmm. That that's the goal here. And so, the the how, of course, this is uh, what I'm showing is my how. <laughs> Doesn't mean that is the most uh, you know the best how, but it's uh, I think it's an effective way of helping polymathic people. Of uh, you know there are those kind of efforts. Perhaps let's concentrate here, but not forget this other thing and the role of events that I'm not going to go deep into that, but it's very important how you appraise events. Mm. Sometimes you have what I call filtering events, and sometimes they can be awesomely good. So the example that I give in my dissertation is of two musicians, Brian May, the mm. guitar, guitar, guitarist, mm from Queen and Bruce Dickinson, the, the vocalist from Iron Maiden. So both of them, of course, became uh, uh, widely successful, and wildly and widely, right? Both. And it was a disruption from whatever path they had. In, this, in the case of Brian May, he, he had he interrupted a, a doctoral program in right. physics, right. right? And then he resumed like 30 years after that, I think it was 2009. He stopped into, in, in, in 1979 or something like that and resumed in uh, 2009 or something like that. So being successful as a band member was kind of filtering them. Now you become a musician, of course. Uh, I, I'm going to live the dream. But Bruce Dixon did it differently. He kept doing other things, you know. He became a, a plane of aircraft pilot. Uh, he made his own beer, uh, well, fencing, whatever. He did a lot of stuff, you know, like in the way. So he kind of, he, I think he, he kind of tried to cap, you know, being more polymathic. Mm -hmm. and, and for Brian May, it was more a hiatus, you know, like, okay, let me be a musician, then go back to be a physician, uh, physicist afterwards. So there are events like that, and, and people are praised, and you know, respond to that differently. And of course, I think we already, I think it's well covered by now, the role of the environment, you know, the example that we talked about, Leonardo da Vinci, mm -hmm. <laughs> being in a place that was possible to mm -hmm. be Leonardo. Yeah, exactly. So. so you have basically the beginning of life where you have potential, you have middle where you're, you're growing your polymathy, 
And then you have this last stage where you can really contribute in significant ways to the world because of all of that. Yes, and that's very important. So it is because of polymathy. So this manifest polymath is not contribution because you are special. Uh, um, Empowered by polymathy. Mm. You can put a trademark there. Powered by polymathy. <laughs> Powered by polymathy. So that's it. So polymathy is basically a prerequisite for some kinds of contributions that depend on you being broader yeah. than usual and integrate in a successful way. There are many failed integrations too, they are part of that, right? Mm. So, but this is, that's why you put effort. Because sometimes efforts are not uh, successful. Do you think that the quality of a contribution that a very strong polymath can make to the world, like how would you differentiate the quality of that contribution from the quality of a contribution that a very expert specialist can make? Yes. So, again, going to creativity, because when we talk about contributions, we are talking about creativity, which is defined as something that's both novel and useful. So we, we have different kinds of uh, creativities from... I'm going to just uh, stop sharing the screen. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that's we can okay. really hear, like... Oh, yeah, close it. <laughs> we, we so I have really different forms of creativity, okay? Uh, from expanding something that's already there to mm -hmm. more incremental type of creativity. Generally, it's more the specialist type. Right? So after a technology is there, now we, how do we make it better? Okay, so you are an aircraft engineer. So how can I make, I don't know, the rudder connect better with the pilot? You're not doing any of the aircraft. It's novel, it's a new system, let's say. It's useful, okay, and but it's incremental. Mm -hmm. And then there are the other types of uh, ideas, okay? So how, what about the oblique wing instead of this, this? This is a more radical idea. In fact, this exits, okay? So this is a different type. I, I think the second one is more polymathic. It's more out of the box. Mm -hmm. Not super polymathic because it's still domain specific. Okay, more polymathic things are really things that you were bringing some idea from another experience. So we're still in the aircraft industry. Uh, uh, Howard Head is a good example. So he was an aircraft engineer uh, that was a specialist or expert in, in building aircraft. And he knew that uh, lightweight materials were very important because you have to save fuel, blah, blah, blah. That was in the... 50s probably. And then he went to ski someday. Okay, to go to ski, and he was a disaster, and people made fun of him. And then he said, you know what? The problem is not me, the problem is the ski. <laughs> the ski is too, you know, cumbersome. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, and like when people would say, yeah, it's not your fault that's the ski, and you know, <laughs> but in fact, he was kind of correct. So he went back and made a lightweight material. <laughs> and it was much better. He changed the field. And then he did the same with tennis. So <laughs> the racket was wooden, right? And then, okay, let's apply the same concept, the lightweight materials, you know? Yeah. So you need to have experience in two domains, at least, to do that. Yeah. So there are, this is, a, 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 this is a kind of contribution that's empowered by experiencing multiple domains. Yeah. Well, sometimes the depth comes from one domain in the experience in the other domain is initially more shallow or like a, a hobby, an avocation, and that's an example. So he went on vacation and then that's the idea. I'm gonna become a millionaire because I, I knew about, I had, I had depth in this field and I saw a, a problem in it. Mm -hmm. And so there is this thing, like, I think it's important to think of polymathy as a life project because the initial goal is not necessarily to be able to do this kind of things. You know, the initial thing is like, here is the world. And in the beginning, uh, I would use this metaphor. It's like, you know, when you go to Google Maps and everything is like, in the before it renders, it's a blur. Mm -hmm. So that's how we start seeing the world. 
yeah. it's a blur and it's not a blur in the places where your family or significant adults say it's not a blur <laughs> it's not a blur there when they say oh this is how it is right mm -hmm. but the polymathic person's like i can't live with this big blur you know all around me mm -hmm. i have to make it i have to render those so you explore let me render this yeah. <laughs> i went into finance because of that i just i can't die without understanding how this thing works mm -hmm. because it's so important I, I, I saw it as so consequential to the world how, how can i not understand what a black Scholes formula is you know <laughs> doesn't mean that i i was going to contribute in that domain you know mm -hmm. oh let me do a formula that's better than black and Scholes. that wasn't the idea it was just let me render <laughs> this this part of the world i think that's Polymath is a lot about that. It's a yeah. lot about apparent efforts for you to, to have a better understanding. And the contributions come later. So my knowledge in finance helped me do a lot of stuff, including the scale development, which, mm -hmm. of course, uh, is not at the same field, but the mathematical tools yeah. that, I, that I built there so uh, I can use, so I got yeah. stronger in, in, in that problem, you know, in solving that problem mm -hmm. because of this crazy path. And that's it. It's it, like Steve Jobs said that, I don't know how many years ago, you connect the dots backwards, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you don't know. But yeah, it's difficult to know where or when the pieces of information that you gather out of curiosity, out yeah. of... You know, I, I like to give this example of rendering because it's a more, ex, more how can I say, specific type of curiosity, you know? So it's, at least it's how it works for me. This is my curiosity. Render it, render it. Yeah. <laughs> make it, you know, make it a better picture. But the more you render, the harder it is, right? And then you, you zoom in, zoom in, zoom in. Then you need a lot of power right. to make the, the picture so you cannot render all the world in the best quality. Right. So polymath is about choosing yeah. the, 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 the places that you're going to render very well, the places that are going to be blurry, and the places that are going to be in the middle. Yeah, polymaths probably are not going to be excellent at everything. It's you got to prioritize. And one of the reasons I was drawn to the word polymath as opposed to some of the other neighboring concepts was because it got at this idea that you could have depth, you could be excellent at multiple things. Because I, for me, I wanted to have the full human experience, learn as much as I could, but I didn't want to be a dabbler. Like I wanted to really be excellent in several things. And maybe I'm okay at a few things, and maybe I'm crappy at other things, mm -hmm. you know? Like where it's not all, like someone is genius everywhere or someone is an idiot everywhere. We're all a little bit of both. <laughs> And it's a social uh, phenomenon, of course. So you're going to have competition. So there are the people who's, who are going to spend a lot of energy rendering, you know, that pixel. And perhaps it, the contribution is there. So the polymathic people can understand perhaps the, not at that pixel level. So <laughs> some zoom levels, you know, uh, last, but that's the combination so i understand this thing here and in combination with this thing it's about also trying to understand some general things that help you yeah. so it's like now i understand shapes so if you understand shapes every time that you render something it's a blur but it looks like a sphere you know because you understand what the sphere is mm -hmm. so a lot of polymath is under the in introspective efforts Oh, there are shapes. Yeah. And then, oh, it looks like a, a, a cube. It looks like, you know, and then you can see even before you render, right? Yeah. <laughs> so. I, I just want to touch upon one other thing you said, which is um, one of the things that I love about different flavors of different polymaths is that when a person does naturally just follow their inclinations, their curiosity, their own preferences, and they take this zigzag path through the land of, learning, uh, they become more and more original, more and more unique. 
the combination they have becomes more and more unlikely mm -hmm. to be replicated elsewhere. So there's a lot of value in learning based on your passions, even if you don't think it's going to be useful. You may think, oh, you know, I want to learn how to make something. I want to become a woodworker or whatever the case may be, but it probably won't be useful. And you just never know. You just never know. Mm -hmm. um, there was an example I heard one time, and I'm not going to explain it very well, but there was a scientist who was working on DNA and there was some sort of break or some sort of problem in the DNA that they were trying to find and they were having trouble. So this person could play piano. So they played the DNA as music. They, and then they could hear it. They could hear what break was. And people may think, well, playing piano is not that useful of a skill, but in this instance, it was very useful. So I just want to encourage anyone watching this, like follow your own curiosities, even if it seems like a waste of time to other people, or it, it's not something you can put on your resume. Well, if you enjoy that kind of learning, yes, enjoy it. So there is this concept, in fact, that I bought from Barbara Share. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Refuse to choose? Yeah, perfect. So it's a popular book. I, I'm here, like second doctorate, you know, trying to publish in the most difficult journals in academia, blah, blah, blah. But like I get insights from everywhere, right? So she has a very important insight that uh, what's your prize in doing that? Mm. Sometimes your prize in playing the piano is that I just want to play a song that I really like. I don't want to be a virtuoso. I don't want to use that, you know, or I just want to play that. And then you get your prize and it's done. Yeah. And some things are like that. So you, you get your prize and it's gone. It, it, I mean, the urge is gone. <laughs> then you go to the next thing. It, it, it is okay. Yeah. So what is, uh, yeah, uh, I'm going to uh, enter in a normative sense what's not okay. Yeah, in, in body mass theory, it's never developing the, the depth mm -hmm. and never caring for the integration. And integration is a matter of being alert. Mm -hmm. Just like, you know, or generally, it. Generally, it, it, it is that there are other techniques. Of course, you, you, you can be pur purposeful in doing integrations, but a lot of them are more like the alertness kind, where you're living your life and then something, you know, kind of magically connects. So mm -hmm. I think that's, uh, but anyways, uh, I think the most, one of the biggest challenges is where uh, do I make an effort to increase my depth? Mm, yeah, those are some hard decisions. Yeah. I mean, especially as someone who's multi-capable, good at learning, has a lot of opportunity potentially. Making those choices about what am I going to get really good at can be really hard. And also when you're, this is one of my challenges. It's like, I want to do so many things and they all require time and energy. And yeah. it's really hard. Like I have to say, no, I have to like put things off. And there are things I really want to do. This is part of the burden of being a, a polymath. And that's where polymath science can uh, integrate the other findings from let's say traditional uh, science about comparative advantages, about, you know, uh, uh, energy management, motivation, drive mm -hmm. theory. So I think those things have to be together. But if we don't have a science of polymath, it's, it's going to be sca scattered. So polymath also has this uh, promise of bringing together a lot of very interesting research strands mm -hmm. that can inform this kind of very difficult decisions. Because there are ways of doing that. You know, every person is unique, but if you think like this at the extreme, then it's not helpful. Oh, it's unique, so I cannot help you. You have to find your own path. Mm -hmm. Then it's not helpful, right? So you have to find a middle ground. Okay, everybody's unique. But this kind of problem, what characteristics of this problem okay, is common and is there? So somebody has thought about that. A lot of those things, people have thought about mm -hmm. what drives you to do something, what motivates you to do something. Uh, how should I decide between X and Y? So comparative advantage is one way. What we do in entrepreneurship is another way. Mm -hmm. Looking at value, looking at rarity, looking at the fit, 
So that's a very strong model. So you look at, so uh, a student came to me, I have this opportunity to travel as a exchange student, okay? So from the US, where should I go, okay? So Germany, England, or Thailand? Okay. I would choose Thailand because the, <laughs> the likelihood of unique combinations is much yeah. <laughs> is there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's one way to make a decision. We have those tools. They are just not integrated yeah. in the framework. Stretch, yeah, do the things that scare you the most, maybe. Yeah. Um, what else should we know about your dissertation? What else would you like to share with us? Yeah, I think we covered, uh, I'm very happy. Okay, we covered a lot. <laughs> because we covered a lot. And I think the very important points were covered. Uh, yeah, the five, and I think the one of the key points of importance of the polymathic orientation as a thing and as a scale that can be used to help people, uh, to help people help people. <laughs> First, for, for you to kind of diagnose yourself as a polymath or polymathic person and say, all right, school, can you help me in this path? Yeah. Because people, are, especially children, kids, they would totally be afraid of, you know, I, I have this other project. And it's kind of, uh, I think the status quo nowadays is like, why should you be doing that? Why are you wasting your time doing that? If you specialize, you're going to be more productive. Uh, that those kinds of assumptions are not true uh, in many circumstances, especially nowadays, where work requires more creativity, more adaptability. So, going back to to my example, so I'm a scientist now. I could publish I don't know 20 papers a year if I was the methods person doing that method all the time, they just gave me a different database, okay? So I'm doing the same thing. So database one, blah, 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 do the same thing, write the results. Database two, do the same thing, write the results. That That's very productive, you know, that's very effective. It's efficient. It's efficient. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But there would are sides. Would I be a happy researcher doing that? If that was my goal, I wouldn't be a researcher who is working on every <laughs> <laughs> so many people are repetitive. It's the same. Do people need more intellectual stimulation in the same way? One of the things I've been thinking about too and wondering, and I'm not expert in neuroscience and not expert in ADHD, but I've talked to some people who are, and there is some loose beginning discussions, some thinking that what if this desire to learn very broadly and very deeply is this hungry mind that polymaths have, what if it's like a form of productive ADHD? Or, you know, like, do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, yes. There are some papers about something related to that, like ADHD as an evolutionary thing for you to explore more. So they had a study, an experiment where they they were like people were were uh, presented with bushes and they would have to pick berries mm -hmm. like virtually <laughs> all experience they have limitations okay <laughs> I'm defending the other people's papers anyway so they found that people that are like high functional ADHD they don't exhaust the bush they go to the to other bushes faster and they, they collect more berries this way. Hmm. Don't, don't see it as super compelling <laughs> evidence, but that's a theory. You it's know? a theory. It's, it's a possibility. That, so if done this way, again, we, we go back to uh, individual differences in humans, mm -hmm. right? So those differences that are still here, okay, that are, you know, like in this normal spectrum, let's say, generally they have a reason of, of being, you know? Mm -hmm. And it, it might be something happens at the extreme, you know, and then it becomes like very dysfunctional. And it, it's very important to, to choose. That's what I don't like so much because ADHD started as really, let, let's see those people that really, really need a lot of help because they really 
cannot focus or that's to an extent that's very disruptive for them. To those people that are, you know, much less disruptive, they it's more almost like a personality, you know, thing, like being an introvert, an extrovert, you know, mm -hmm. almost like a disrespect. It's just a way of doing things, not necessarily too disruptive, you know. Mm -hmm. And like these studies, they look at the less disruptive part. Right. So, so my last question for you is, so here we are in Louisville, Kentucky. <laughs> It's March 2024. We've known each other six years now. So much has happened. And you are about to embark on a whole new journey. Okay. You're finishing your second PhD <laughs> here. And you're about to move to Sydney, Australia, where you'll yeah. be teaching for a very excellent university there. And so I'm wondering for you, like, what are your, your hopes and dreams for yourself as a professional, as an academic? What do you want to be said about you at your Feshrift? Which is a word, no, yeah. uh, you know, like Dean Keith Simonson had a fetch rift at one of our conferences we attended, and it's basically review um, mm -hmm. the contributions. And I expect that at your fetch rift, hopefully I'll be there and talk about <laughs> the good old days. True, um, true. But what are, you, what are your goals now from here? Like once you're done at the Louisville, University of Louisville? Like... Yeah. No, no, yeah. I think our generation has this thing, AI, that's completely mm -hmm. different from other generations. So it's difficult to, of course, you can always say that it's difficult to predict the future, even like uh, 40 years ago. But I think, let's say we are talking about generation of uh, Simonton and, and, and others. Still, it was well, like, oh, we can kind of see, you know, the future. This, this, is, this has the potential to be so disruptive and dangerous in all other things that, yeah, I, I, I'm not even thinking about that that big horizon. So, but at least in five, 10 years, I think it's very important that polymathy becomes a field mm. be, that we talk about the science of polymathy mm -hmm. and that the science of polymathy can integrate the, the wisdom that's already there about decision making, about comparative advantages. So it's the psychology of uh, behavior and decision making. So what motivates me, what drives me, the economics of that. So how do I choose between X and Y? Mm -hmm. uh, other things, the sociology of it, so which uh, conditions things are going to happen, likely to happen this way or that way. So those disciplines bringing you know, being put together to help the, the science of polymathy. So if I could be the person uh, catalyzing mm -hmm. this, I think that would be huge because let's go back to your question. So how many people are polymaths? So if you talk about polymathic orientation, even if it's 10%, it's still how many people on earth now? 8 billion? Something like that, yeah. <laughs> so, it's going to be a billion in the near future, right? In and, some years. And that 10% say of the 8 billion, what if, if there was a real awareness and understanding of how to elicit their fullest yeah. potential? As and it's not 10%. Percent. It's, since it's a spectrum, so it's right. going to be more like, uh, you know, 30% and applicable, perhaps it's going to be flipping it around, applicable to 80% of people. And only 20% that are, I would like to be a doctor from age five. Mm -hmm. And I think even this, this people, I think it's very difficult to live your whole life as a, as a neurospecialist. A, a, at one time, you're going to say, my God, I have only rendered this, you know, <laughs> this, uh, let me say, this frame mm -hmm. of the world. What about the other frame? At least... I, I can see how a human wouldn't feel the stress at some point in life, you yeah. know, by not being a little bit more. I don't mean that they are going to want to be super polymathic, a little bit more. I think it's uh, very human. Yeah. Like For me, polymathy really is about exploring possibilities, exploring potential, mm -hmm. and, you know, seeing, seeing what enlivens you and where you feel authentic. 
where you feel like you can contribute to others. For me, that's my personal flavor. My favorite flavor of polymath is when there's not only like a strong mind, but this good heart that wants to do something to help other people with it too. And that's not all polymath, but that's my favorite. <laughs> that's true. That's true. So, and they're powerful in the world, you know, a good polymath with a smart brain and good at learning and a good moral compass can really do great things for the rest of us. So that's part of why I want to support polymath in the world as well. Any final thoughts before we go? Uh, not so good like viral thoughts. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I'm happy that this is happening once again. I think my final thoughts is the same as the initial thought. So it's been a journey for us personally, and I'm happy to see that being resonating with more people, like you said in the beginning. So it's something that we didn't know it, it would apply to so many people. And we are receiving so much, you know, good feedback, and we can help people now from our journey. So I'm just uh, happy <laughs> to leave this place and, and uh, yeah, excited to, to do more stuff and be in a different position now there to, to be able to advance more stuff. Yeah. I do want to talk in the future about the my other project that's also related, which is the Atlas of Human Interests, mm -hmm. which is an idea to map not only, you know, the, the content knowledge, but human interests, human action, mm -hmm. where humans spend their time, energy, and passion. Yeah. That, that's not my next big project. Well, <laughs> I, I have no doubt we'll continue to make great contributions in academia, especially. You are just such a <laughs> science kind of guy. You want to be a scientist? Yeah, there yeah. you are. <laughs> that's true. All right, everyone. Well, thank you so much for watching. It was such a pleasure to chat with you. Um, and thank you for all you do to promote polymathy in such a rigorous academic way. <laughs> I, could, I couldn't do it the way you do. <laughs> all right, everybody. Thanks for watching. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye.